Thank you, everyone. I'm going to spend the next 18 minutes or so talking to you about conservation, and I'm going to describe the process I went through in going from being a young biologist, just running around the jungles looking for animals, to now being in the position where I'm in the lucky position of being able to influence government policy on environmental issues. Now, there's many reasons to want to be a biologist, and first and foremost for me is the fact that my family are all biologists. My father was a biologist and the head of seal research in the British Antarctic Survey. My mother was a biologist and who's worked all across the world from East Africa to Central America and many places in between. My brother Finn is a biologist who's been on two remote area expeditions with me. And my brother Rory is not only a biologist and a wildlife artist, but as far as I know, he's the only person ever to have read Harry Potter on the back of a giant tortoise. <laughs> now, the other main reason for wanting to be a biologist is because it's beautiful and it's fascinating. And I can think of no better thing to do with my life than to study the world around me and the animals that live in it. Now, I've dedicated my career to endangered species research, because those are the ones that most need our help. And one of the things about many endangered species is that they only survive in remote areas. And something I've noticed is that almost no matter where you go, there are people. And this is something I'd like you all to think about during this talk. Because when it comes to the environment, people are intrinsic to everything. People are absolutely the problem, but people are also the solution. And it's one of the greatest challenges we face to communicate the importance of conservation to anyone that has other things on their mind. Now, my career ostensibly started after my A-levels when I traveled to Mauritius to volunteer my time as a biologist for the Mauritius Wildlife Foundation, working with some of the rarest birds on Earth, but also working with many other scientists as well who were a little bit further down their career and were incredibly passionate about what they did. And one of these guys, Paul, had been to South America during his degree, and he happened to have seen giant otters. And I thought, that sounded like a fantastic idea. I want to go, and I want to see giant otters. So I decided then and there that two and a half years later, I was going to go to South America to study giant otters. So I spent two and a half years putting together a team and raising the funds. And indeed, two and a half years later, off we went to Bolivia, and we spent seven weeks in the Amazon and the Pantanal, studying giant otters. Now, Bolivia is a fascinating country. It's beautiful, it's got wonderful biodiversity, and it's got some very, very interesting social sides as well. We were in one village where there was a husband and wife couple, and the wife was called Jesus, and she was married to Adolf. And it's <laughs> that they had a daughter called Uznavi, literally after the US Navy. <laughs> now, our job, which we defined for ourselves, was simply to get up first thing in the morning, canoe down the river, and look for giant otters. But most importantly for us, as four young biologists, was that the biodiversity research we did there was the first that had ever been done in the three parts of Bolivia that we were working. And it felt fantastic being a pioneer in biological research at such a young age. Now, after I graduated, I went out to Namibia to work for the Institute of Zoology, studying black-backed jackals that live and feed on the Cape Cross seal colony. And it was a wonderful thing, living in an incredibly remote and arid environment, and yet still seeing the diversity of life there. But the most important thing for me was working with other local conservationists, people equally dedicated to the conservation of their own wild places and their own wildlife. And one of them, Vinny, was a particularly special individual. His real name was Moilima Moilima, but he liked to be called Vinny. And <laughs> one day, Rob and I went for a walk for about five hours, leaving Vinny in camp, and we came back, and it was, it was sunset, and it was about time for a hot chocolate. So I dug into the back of the car, where we had a two-kilo pot of powdered Milo. I dug in, and I was like, Vinny, Vinny, where's all the hot chocolate gone? And he just looked at me with this kind of sheepish look and went, sir, it was so sweet. <laughs> Like, he'd eaten two kilograms of powdered chocolate dry with a spoon in the previous time. I wasn't even angry. Vinny, I'm just impressed. That's amazing, man. It really is. Now, in 2009, Rob and I went out to Guyana, which is an incredible country nestled next to Venezuela. It has only 800,000 people in the whole country and 76% rainforest cover still today. And we were there ostensibly to study giant otters once again. But when we did a little bit more research, we realized that no one had actually been there before, really. And certainly no one had done any biological research. So we brought a load of camera traps with us to try and photograph some, some wonderful mammals, such as this, which is a lowland tapir. And as well as surveying birds as we were canoeing up and down the rivers, we also brought with us some mist nets to try and catch some of the birds that may be harder to see. In, from normal survey techniques. Now, something that was fascinating for me was noticing how different species respond in the hand. So the golden crown spade bill would almost go into cardiac arrest the second you held it. So you couldn't measure it. You could do nothing more than simply get it out of the net and release it. Whereas the Amazon green kingfisher, 
wanted to pick your eyes out, which was an issue until we discovered the most amazing thing. If you turn them upside down, they pass out. <laughs> so turn it this way, and it's trying to pick your eyes out. That way, and it passes out. It was just a wonderful discovery. Again, pioneering biological research we're talking about here. <laughs> Now, the maps we used to navigate our way along this river were taken during an aerial survey in 1970. And when you look down upon the map, parts of it were just white and said cloud. Because when the photograph was taken, it was cloudy, and no one knows what's underneath there. And it was a wonderful thing for Rob and I, going to the parts of the world that are still literally blank on the map. Now, we motored for 90 miles from the nearest Amerindian village until we reached this incredible feature, this series of cataracts which divide the lower Rewa, which still has some human traffic, mainly Amerindian hunters, from the upper Rewa, which is totally and utterly pristine. It took us two days to carry all our gear around these cataracts, and then no sooner had we got into the real Rewa head than we witnessed our first giant of the Amazon, a silk cotton tree, a kapok tree as it's otherwise known. And then 800 meters further on, we came across this. Now, that is an anaconda. Now, as biologists, it's our prerogative to try and record everything we see, which, for things like snakes and spiders, means catching and measuring them and that type of stuff. But when I was faced with the prospect of having to try and catch that, all I could think of was stories that had been told to me by many people in the past about anacondas. And the one that kept on coming back to me was from my my guide from back in Bolivia, who had one night he'd been out canoeing in a little, little dugout canoe in an oxbow lake, in an oxbow lake with his cousin. And they were paddling along in the night, and he heard a splash, and an anaconda came out of the water and grabbed his cousin and pulled him over the side of the boat, and he disappeared into the blackness of the night. So I had that <laughs> going on in my head as I sat there wondering about the prospect of catching this and ruled it out completely. But then, three weeks later, we came back downriver again, after surveying as far up as we could go, and it was still there. And we'd built up a bit of bravado by this point, and we thought, well, maybe we could, maybe we could. And we did. And it turns out to be one of the largest snakes ever caught anywhere in the world. It was 18 feet 2 inches long, with a girth of 27 inches. So that's a girth of your waist. Now, we were delighted to contribute these data to the world of herpetology, the world of anaconda studies, but also it was just immensely exhilarating for us as well, as you can see from the incredibly excited looks on our faces. But it wasn't until I studied this photograph later date that I realized that perhaps it was a little bit too exciting. <laughs> I, I, I still have no explanation for that. I, I hope it was sweat, but, but I'm not quite sure. Now, the wildlife of the area was absolutely incredible. As I said, most of the animals had never seen people before, which meant that we could get far closer to animals that are normally shy under normal conditions. And when we checked our camera traps, we photographed giant anteaters in the middle of the Amazon. They shouldn't be there, but they are. We also photographed puma, jaguar, ocelot, margay, 50% of Guyana's endangered species on one stretch of one small river. This place was a treasure trove of biodiversity, and yet it was all under threat. When we came back down into the lower river again, we discovered a series of gold mining claims literally nailed to the trees as we were going down the river. And when we got back to the capital and did some research, we discovered that the entire east bank of the river belonged to a logging concession owned by a Canadian logging company, and everything could be lost. And we just couldn't let that happen. We couldn't. But what could we do? We were two 27-year-old biologists from England. How on earth could we possibly have an influence on what happened there? So when we got home, we, we wrote a report, very, very detailed, detailing the exquisite nature of the biodiversity there, but also the incredibly poignant threat to it all and what was happening right now. And we managed to get that report into the hands of some real movers and shakers in the conservation movement. And six months after we returned to the UK, all of those gold mining claims were revoked by presidential decree. And we received a letter of thanks from the former head of the Guyanese military, Major General Joe Singh, saying, thank you for your work and thank you for bringing my attention to this situation. Suddenly we had done something. Now, I've spent most of the last four and a half years or so working on my PhD on an animal called Baird's tapir in Honduras. Now, Baird's tapir is the largest mammal in Central America, and it's also one of the rarest. So rare, in fact, that I've never seen one, despite <laughs> which bugs me eternally. 
Now, Honduras is an amazing country. They say that 70% of the country is at a 40 degree angle, but it has some real societal difficulties. It has the highest murder rate in the world. Almost one person per thousand is murdered every single year. To put into perspective that someone you know is murdered every single year. That is over double the murder rate of Mexico. Now, if you look at this photograph, he's carrying a rifle. He's carrying a rifle. He slept with a pistol underneath his pillow in his hammock every single night that we were there. So how do you convince someone about the virtues of conservation not to shoot jaguar, not to shoot tapir, when they're genuinely worried about whether or not they're going to be killed by their next-door neighbor in the morning? But you've got to try. Now, I know that Marco has killed tapir. He told me. And when he told me, I said, oh, Marco, you do realize there's only 500 tapir left in Honduras. Ah, 499 now. And in one sentence, without preaching to him, I enabled him to understand that he can have a personal and tangible impact on the world around him. Now, it's been an absolute privilege for me working in the types of places where there are people who have never seen white people before and seeing the types of things that white people have never seen before. Now, my brother is a normal-sized human being. <laughs> We still don't know what that thing is, but, but it's amazing. I, I showed it to a botanist from Honduras, and he kind of scratched his head and then went, that's surprising. Because <laughs> it is surprising. It's wonderful. But I spent most of my time in Honduras working in one national park. It's called Casuco National Park in the northwest of the country. It was recently announced the 123rd most irreplaceable protected area anywhere on Earth, and the 25th most irreplaceable for endangered amphibians. Now, it used to be a stronghold for tapir, and that's why I was there. But it also is remarkable for other types of biodiversity, obviously amphibians, but also insects. This is the first and only time I've ever seen a nest of, of army ants, a bivouac of army ants. It has the largest moth in the world, with a wingspan of over a foot. And some of the animals display behaviors that I'm convinced have never been seen before <laughs> anywhere else whatsoever. Pioneering biological research right there. But it's all under threat. It's all seriously under threat. This is the sign saying, welcome to Kasuko National Park. The 123rd most irreplaceable place in the world. Welcome. And it's all dying under our noses. Now, I was there to study tapir, as I said. And this is a graph which shows what happened to the encounter rate with tapir footprints between 2006 and 2013. Fine, 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 and then suddenly plummets. 2011, 12, 13. And this is what I have calculated is actually happening to the population in that time. Probably gone from about 50 down to probably about 25 since 2006. And because they were disappearing, I started to go to the parts of the park that nobody else goes to in order to try and find them. And what I discovered when I went there was that people were going there, and they were hunting, and they were chopping down the forest, and they were growing marijuana and coffee and other cash crops. And they were doing so at a rate that would see my beloved Baird's tapir extinct in that national park in the next five to ten years. So I had to do something. I just I couldn't let that happen. And I was able to arrange a meeting with the Minister for Environment in Honduras. And I, I explained to him what was happening to the tapir. I showed him the data. I showed him my report from the park. I told him about the marijuana, about the deforestation, about everything else that was happening. And I convinced him to militarize the national park. And since August 2012, so under two years, we have had military patrols protecting the national resources of that national park every single week. And the first prosecutions have just started to take place. Now, the best achievement about what happened that summer wasn't militarizing a national park in a foreign country. But that takes some doing. But it was what that achievement meant for every single one of the young biologists that I have spoken to since that time. Because it's made them realize that they too can have an impact far wider than they thought was possible in whatever sphere that they think is relevant. Now, in the 21st century, it's easy for all of us to be conservationists, and all of us should be conservationists. You can start simply by speaking to your family and your friends and encouraging them to take an interest in conservation in the environment and in sustainability. You can tweet, you can use social media, write blogs, sign petitions, write to your MP. It's their job to listen to you, it really is. It's very easy to be an armchair activist, and all of us should be. 
Now, what I've discovered about conservation is that conservation is all about communication. It needs armchair activists tweeting and writing blogs and signing petitions and communicating their displeasure with what's happening to the world. It needs people on the ground running around the jungles looking for animals and communicating the baseline data that they collect to the widest audience. And it absolutely needs people in the boardrooms of environmentally damaging companies and in the offices of politicians making their point face to face to the people that can actually influence policy. The conservation heroes of the past were those people with the storytelling skills to bring the world to life. The conservation heroes of the future will be those with the negotiating skills to guarantee the integrity of the most precious thing of all, the world around us. Thank you ever so much.